That lovely green line that we are now streaming and welcome, it's Sunday night, it's eight o'clock and you're watching Let's Kill Twitter with me, Julian Hall. This is the show that aims to detox your timeline with the art of conversation. Fortunately, I don't have to do that alone. I've got a fantastic guest with me tonight, comedian Callie Beaton. But just before I introduce Callie properly, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you're obviously watching us already, which means you'll be watching us live on either Facebook Live, on YouTube or on Twitch. You can also catch up with the show afterwards on the stream that's downloaded to YouTube or Facebook Live. But please do it on YouTube because I think the quality's better. And also you could give us a lovely subscribe there. Um, speaking of which, the all important thing is to follow us on our Twitter account, LKT Zoom, which you can see on the screen share here with me. Um, all our updates go up there and clips and whatnot. But also you can tweet at us during the show, which I actively encourage that you do. Um, I think that might be enough housekeeping. Suffice to say that I'm enjoying the second week with a green screen behind me and also with a fairly decent webcam to boot. I think that makes our production values right up there with GB News. But that won't be the last time you hear about GB News tonight. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our fantastic guest this evening. She's a comedian, a writer, a speaker, a podcaster a business mentor, you may have seen her on QI, made regular appearances on there, or on The Apprentice, You're Fired, or heard her on Radio Force in uh, Unbelievable Truth, and you was gonna stumble on that one, Museum of Curiosity, or the fantastic Saturday Live. Please welcome Callie Beaton. Hello. Hi, Julian, thank you so much. Lovely to be, is this you high tech then? Because I'm just looking around and going, so this is you maximum, <laughs> Maximum tech, is it? That maximum tech. Zoom plus OBS equals thumbs up, essentially. Wow. I, I mean, I, I, I've just got a picture I stole out of my teenage daughter's bedroom and I just slapped it on the wall behind me and this is it. I, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant picture. Is that, is that Billy Holiday? Is it? I don't think it is Billy Holiday, no. It says life is beautiful. Irony. Uh, oh, we could, yeah. we could totally, yeah, we could totally oh. trash life. But we're here to trash oh, Twitter. But... Um, I wanted to first ask you, so the first, well, I wanted to kick off because your um, CV is obviously mahoosive, um, but and one of the things that really kind of bridges it very nicely is how you got into comedy, which was through the late, great Joan Rivers, and she sort of helped you, your narrative arc go from your sort of corporate existence, which obviously you still have elements of, to uh, you as a comedian. How did that happen? I like the way you're getting me to start with a clunking great name drop, just so people oh, be like, oh, oh Callie Beaton, here's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but you made me do it. So yes, I worked for years and still do work a bit in the TV industry off camera. And I worked for Comedy Central for many years, um, the US Comedy Central. And I was actually across the sort of business side of, of Viacom CBS. So I had a sort of boring revenue generating job, but I did work with talent and creatives quite a lot. And we would get to know some of the kind of big on-screen names we'd be working with at any point because we would kind of organize corporate events where they would do a turn and we would try and get jaded TV executives to invest in the programs we were trying to do. And that's how I met Joan Rivers. So I did a few bits and bobs with Joan Rivers, sort of traveled with her a few times and was basically her de facto warm up wow. at business events where I would do the businessy bit and she would come on and do a turn. And then um, the last time I saw her, we had dinner together. Um, it was actually not long before she died, not connected, right, I, I was should say. say. So, you weren't interviewed <laughs> so we, afterwards, were you? Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't want that to be the revelation tonight. Um, and, um, and basically, she, yeah, she said to me over dinner, she said, you know, Kelly, you should think about being a, a stand-up. Um, and I said to her, Jen, I'm 45, as I then was. I'm 45, I said, I've got a massive day job. I'm a single mum of two kids. One of them's got special needs. I am, there's no way, the ship has sailed, it's too late for me to think <laughs> about that And she said, stuff. you've she already said, written your first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you've written your first five, and she said, I'm 81, Kelly. you're 45, you're in the thick of it. So it took an 81-year-old woman telling me that a 45-year-old person is not old, and anyone listening or watching who, um, I think that's very good advice, whatever age you are, you'll look back and go, God, wish I'd done all that stuff 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I, I was still young. So yeah, it was that conversation that got me onto the stage quite late in life. It's pretty fantastic. I mean, I remember seeing Joan actually at the underbelly. Um, I can't remember how long a run she did, but seeing her like being sort of near the front row and not picked on either um, was amazing. And actually, I think the first time I properly met you was after a heat of So You Think You're Funny. 
So I don't know what the um, the timeline was between the two, but a very short space of time, I would imagine. Yeah, it was. I did say you think you're funny when I've been going about four months, and I didn't realise. Oh. Um, I know not everybody watching this will know what that is, but as you know, it's quite a prestigious newcomers competition. I didn't realise that you're meant to have been going a year, but people fudge it slightly. I didn't realise that having been going literally four months, I was quite fresh to be doing it. So that's my caveat for why I didn't win. <laughs> Well, it's, and because uh, you obviously didn't vote for me, Julian. Well, I, if I'm tracking my brains today thinking, <laughs> I can't remember if I did or I didn't, actually. Well, I didn't get through, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's not all... I mean, I'd love to think that all comedy competitions in Edinburgh were all down to me, but they absolutely weren't. I mean, <laughs> I've still got memories of being only one of two people in the room that wanted to put Michael McIntyre on a certain list. But, hey, what, what can you say? Um, what can you not say? That he, not that he really <laughs> needed it. Um, so, yeah, now, let me think now. So, Joan... That is pretty an amazing stuff. You touched on something there that about whether or not, um, did you suddenly think, oh, I should have done this years ago? Or were you just really happy with like, oh, now actually the time is right to be doing what I'm doing? No, I sort of, um, and again, I do, I do talk about this because I do a lot of kind of corporate keynote speaking now as well, because um, obviously, because it pays better than comedy. No, I actually do quite like doing it. And one of my sort of big things I bang on about is sort of um, people think, and there'll be lots of people probably watching tonight who are going through loads of changes in their lives and where they're like, oh my God, I lost my job or this thing went wrong. And we often think when it's that you have to sort of compromise when you make radical life changes and sort of almost forget who you were before to become someone new. And one of the things that I love about comedy is I realized I didn't, all the stuff I'd been doing for 30 years, speaking on stages and introducing industry panels and just generally kind of kicking around this planet earth for for that many years sort of had partly set me up for it so i'd always i did i was a drama student and i did a tiny bit of presenting in my early okay. 20s so i guess it had just lain dormant yeah. for 25 years and then i kicked it into life um and yeah and now it won't die again there it is yeah alive. totally i mean you yeah that's a lot of that's a big skill set really um you should yeah i mean that, that is i didn't realize that you'd had the the drama background uh, it's quite a yeah Quite an interesting Long time story. ago, though, and let me tell you, my was if you think about left brain, right brain, yeah. you know, creative and factual. I was had had a career that was very much, albeit in a creative industry, was all about making money for companies. So I was at the business end. So it was quite a shift to go to, um, and also as you know, nobody laughs at a comedian who's all slick and sorted. People want to see your soft white underbelly. So it took me a bit of time to kind of um, get a bit less slick and allow myself to be a bit more authentic and vulnerable. It's probably why you didn't vote me through, Julian. I was probably too <laughs> slick. You're like, oh, she seems like a business But woman. I did feel very well informed afterwards, I have to say. But that, <laughs> that is go. really interesting because actually shaking off those personas, whether you've come from... So I've seen stand-ups who've come from a sort of, uh, you know, an acting background uh, doing the competitions or, as you say, people doing, say, for example, comedy courses who are coming to do it perhaps to improve their business... Uh, skill set but probably secretly also want to actually you know perform on stage and actually they are both very what's confident that uh, what's they've both got in common is they've confidence on stage they've got from the word go but shaking off the persona to be loose enough to kind of uh, you know roll with the punches is something else isn't it yeah I'll tell you a, a quick and tiny secret given you were a judge in that first competition the reason I think I got as far as the kind of semi-finals of some really big competitions really quickly was because I had stagecraft. I'd spent years on stages, holding rooms, seeming that I knew what I was doing, being plausible, credible. That that side of things, all my corporate kind of training experience really set me up for. And actually, it's been a disadvantage as time's gone on because I didn't really have to muck about and find out what my actual voice was and what I wanted to really say. I could fudge it. And actually, I'd say it's taken me longer than many to really start to dig into what I actually want to be and say on stage. So it was an advantage for probably a year or two. And if anything, might have held me back from getting as good as I want to be. I'm only really finding out that stuff now. So oh, that's swings and roundabouts. It's a, it's sort of, you had to do an unlearning process, basically. Yeah, yeah, I have. And luckily, I mean, underneath it all, I've always been a hot mess. So that wasn't I didn't have to pretend that life wasn't all sewn together nicely because it never has been for me. But I had to remember you don't have to go on stage and pretend it's all, all right. You know, people actually will laugh more if they think, oh, right, you're as fucked up as anyone. That's great. You know, you're one of us. We can relax <laughs> now. We, we like you. You're a mess. There is no more liberating a day when you realise that everybody else is just as much of a mess as you are. And like I say that generally, not you personally. But 
Well, and me personally, that none taken, Julian. No, no, no. I, I, I was like, it's a, it's a very important stage in my life when I realise it's, it's not just me. Now that might bring definitely us not just you quite neatly on to. It does bring us very neatly actually. To the, now you've chosen the first tweet that we're going to discuss is actually your biggest hit tweet. So if you can just uh, read that out and then let us know um, how it amassed so many, why it amassed so many likes, and, and what it means to you. Yes, so today my son leaves uni with a first. My primate-loving, unconventional, autistic son who was bullied, unfriended and who struggled through school is taking his lifelong passion for animals and making a career out of it. Neurodiversity, as important as any other kind. So that was, um, yeah, three years ago now and almost exactly, actually, isn't it? Almost, almost yeah, to the day. Gosh, and that was when he, yeah, when he finished his degree in animal sciences, my autistic firstborn. And he's always like, um, like, like most autistic kids, uh, they develop an encyclopedic knowledge of the thing they're most passionate about in all the world. And in my son's case, from tiny, it was animals. And then from not much bigger than tiny, it was specifically monkeys and apes, so primates. So he is a huge expert on primates. And um, yeah, and he, he so he did at that point did get a zookeeper job. So it was all like, what a lovely, positive story. I was writing pieces for the broadsheets about it. The National Autistic Society were calling me. And then the pandemic came along um at, you know 18 months or less after he'd started his job and he lost his job so he went from being a zookeeper to losing everything not getting he didn't end up on furlough he was kind of last in first out and his world fell apart mm. and then my second most popular ever tweet was one I tweeted about three weeks ago when he's got another job as a zookeeper he's moving to Paynton Zoo in um in two days wow so he, they've been my most popular tweets so so and actually good on him I mean the pandemic it's it's hit he's now nearly 24 and that generation have definitely had it really hard and to see him bounce back from a pretty dark depressive episode has been amazing so I spend ages crafting funny tweets nobody cares and I chuck one out I mean with that that tweet got that many likes within a matter of hours mm -hmm. it was just like ticker tape and that never happens when it's about me <laughs> well actually I mean there's so much in that tweet isn't there I mean it's so I totally understand why it got the reception that it did and also it's just fantastic that there's a, a happy end to that story as well um you know which is a relief i mean it's it's quite hard to quantify what the last sort of 18 months um depending on where you are in your career and all the rest of it the, the kind of havoc that it's that it's played really um, yeah, I think it's been really, my other one's been stuck in Amsterdam. Um, she's over there on um, studying and they locked down extremely quickly last year. And she had the choice, you know, I said to her, look, you're gonna have to decide quickly. Do you want to stay in Amsterdam with your boyfriend or do you want to race home to be here with me? And without skipping a beat, she was like, well, mum, I'll stay here. Um, so she, 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 and I do accept that's a no brainer. So she got stuck over in Amsterdam, which sounds fun, but she was stuck in a flat, you know, she went to study and ended up sitting in a, sitting in a room with her boyfriend which I'm sure is delightful for the first mm. few weeks. And then you're probably like, hmm, I'd quite like a social life now. So I have huge, um, yeah, I have huge respect for that generation. And when everyone's been banging on about why are they in parks and having a laugh and leaving litter, I'm not saying they should be leaving litter or getting absolutely off their tits um, in an irresponsible <laughs> antisocial way. But I do think, blimey, guys, they've had the worst time. Let them have a bit of life. I mean, obviously, if there's a litter problem, all you need is a couple of uh, Scotland football fans to pick it up, from what I've seen. But, uh, yeah, it's a very good point, actually. It, it really is. I mean, we don't really have that uh, that many tweets on, on lockdown, which makes a, a bit of a change from previous shows. But what, what we do have is a lot of tweets on GB News, unsurprisingly. So often there are sort of segments of shows that sort of threaten to overtake it. So I'll try and keep the lid on this. But... Um, GB News has been with us for about a week now. Um, I, I'll sort of, I'll add a little bit of a disclaimer um, in the sense, obviously, I'm a PR, so there are people that have on GB News who has been clients of mine, who are cl clients of mine, or who who will be in the future. And I'll, I'll be honest, I will keep I will keep watching, um, but it's impossible not to have noticed, uh, and, and perhaps inevitable, that there have been a series of fairly sort of epic failures um so we should really get stuck into that because they they sort of they come under various headings um i'm actually gonna i'm gonna start with uh, 
uh, a tweet specifically about the studio. I mean, literally, you have to have different headings for the fails on this. If we start with the studio uh, one, I picked out a tweet from... Oh, it's like you've written a dissertation on this. Do you uh, think you've got a bit obsessed this yeah, week, I Julian? I did get a little bit obsessed with that, actually. Yeah, Hang I can on. see that now. Uh, where is... Uh, this is, the, this is the, the bit where it's become slightly less slick. Oh, no, my fav if my favourite tweet is not here, I will be so... Uh, it's great that it's got slightly less slick at the point you're talking about GB News. I know, it's, it's I know. It's very isn't symbolic. That, I've totally well been found You've out You've all got the that. irony of that. Right, come on. Where are you? Ah, oh, damn. How annoying. There is, basically, I'm going to have to tell you the tweet now. There is a, there's a lovely tweet about the interiors of... Um, from a guy called James who works, I think, at BT Sport. Uh, I'll, I'll find your tweet later, James. Uh, basically says, why does the studio, GB News Studio, look like the inside of a PlayStation 4? And it's like, wow, <laughs> direct hit. Um, I promise to look at that uh, for that tweet properly. I recommend you go and look at our stream for that. Because, I mean, it, that was the first thing. It, it's this dark and moody studio. Yeah. Um, is it a PS4? That was, I think that's a pretty direct hit. It kind of looks like the sort of spaceship that was going to be imminently taken over by an invading force on, you know, Blake 7, if anyone remembers that far back, Doctor Who, take your pick of sci-fi. Or a boy's bedroom in the 1980s. Yeah, or just a boy's bedroom full stop. I think it has that kind of boy's bedroom look and feel and I dare say smell to it. The bit I don't understand, right? I know it's a new channel, but there are people who are working on the channel who, and it's not their first job in television. So if people are capable of creating good content uh, in in television and they've hired those people, the bit I do not understand is how nobody was like, oh, the production values are a bit off and maybe we need to sort the graphics out and the capacity to have OB links and stuff. I don't understand. It's not like they were told to run it with a bunch of GCSE media studies students, although it does look like that. Well, um, I mean... That is, I and mean, they obviously must have had a, uh, you know, a dress rehearsal for this. Um, oh, here we go. How can, how yeah, can I? Yeah, that's good. What is it? There we go. GV News looks hilariously budget, and also why is it being broadcast? Yeah. From Mr. Jones. Perfect. Perfect. There. Well done, James. Um, it, it, yeah, they they obviously had a dress rehearsal, but I mean the key thing that they got wrong on this um, was well the key thing that's still plaguing them is the sound. Now we'll we'll get down to your. Uh, tweet in a minute because even even when the sound goes correctly there are still problems um in fact let's find your tweet on this it's it was... like they haven't thought about i mean news is notoriously the most difficult thing to produce by virtue of the fact that it's topical and it has to be done live uh but it's like they haven't thought about that it's like it's kind of like what bit of this did you not foresee so as someone who's worked in television as a tv executive my whole life i'm like hmm the, a lot of this was avoidable, I would say, but maybe they, maybe it was the big publicity thing. Maybe they thought we're going to go big, we're going to screw everything up, everyone will be talking about us. Um, they know what they couldn't make the news by having opinions that were very, um, you know, counter to what we're seeing on other broadcasts because we knew that was coming. Mm. So maybe this was the way. I don't know. We see. I'd have, I'd have to take a bit of issue with the count the counter opinions, and they are giving voice. I mean, Ash Sarkar described it as culture, all culture war all of the time, which is fairly bang on. Sorry, Ash, probably should have included your tweet there. But, but yeah, and that's true, because we're hearing a lot more about the culture wars. And that is starting to kind of hit the mainstream. It's taken a very long time for some sort of sense of the culture war to actually be discussed in a, in a sort of, you know, normal TV interview, if you like. So I think it's really but how prepared. balanced. How balanced do you think this is ever going to be? And and I accept that nothing we're seeing is balanced. You know, I'm a, a Guardian reader, and the Guardian has got less and less balanced. I would say of late, to the point that I'm starting to find it a bit of a harder read. So, but do, do you really think there'll be much kind of balance and a sensible looking at all sides of the debate on on GB News? Um, I think it it's going to be a bit too echo chambery if the guest patterns retain some you know the way that they've been traveling so far i'm really interested to see some of the people that i have interviewed on i mean i don't agree with um there's a lot of people like dominic samuels i don't agree with her on lockdowns for example but she's a very interesting young voice uh constantine kissin who is trick part of the trigonometry uh podcast I'm always interested um, in what he has got to say. I don't yeah, agree. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I he's an intelligent voice. Exactly. And I don't always agree with him e either, but I, 
you know, I mean, yesterday Andrew Doyle had, who I do massively respect and got a lot of time for, he had Leo Kurse and Steve N. Allen on. Uh, they were sort of trying to balance it. And some of the people that they've had on trying to balance things, you know, it's a good sign that those people are willing to, to come onto GB News to give it that balance. Because, it, yeah, of course, it, it absolutely needs that. Um, speaking of balance... I would think if I didn't know you were taking the piss of GB News a bit in this show, after that, I'd be like, are you doing the PR for GB News, <laughs> Julian? Is that why you set up Let's Kill Twitter? Because you were like, in a few weeks... If, someone's going to need to come in and do a balanced, you know, validation of what it is. Well, I mean, no, I mean, I just, well, I tell you what, I'll get on to, you see, that sort of segues slightly into the reaction about this. Let's go, let's go on to the sound element um, first, because, of course, they've had a lot of hitches with the sound. I mean, honestly, it makes the Zoom communication look absolutely flawless. Um, they've yeah. had, you know, and it's been troublesome for them. But this example that you picked out from the account GB News fails, which obviously set up uh, only in the last week and I think now has, oh my word, 72.8k followers. I mean, uh, that is incredible. It was on 30,000 about two or three days ago. Um, I mean, I yeah, noticed it's they put, up, isn't well, it? Well, yeah. I noticed they put out a tweet saying, um, oh God, what was it? Thanks, to, you know, thanks so much for so many like-minded followers. It's like, that is not how Twitter works. I do not, no. I don't follow an account because I am necessarily like-minded. So I felt a wee bit patronised by that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. there is a constant stream of... Uh, there's a know, lot on there. There's a lot on there. And the one you yeah. picked out um, is here. Um, if you read it out and then I'll press play and we'll get it. So we think this is the first F-bomb. Whoops, could happen to anyone, though. It's happened to us in a previous life at GB News Fail. All right, so this is an interview with Sean Ryder. And need I, need I say more, Look really? at Sean Ryder, though, as well. Look at the two of them. They're, neither of them are at their best, I've got, are they? I've got a good one for you here, Sean. Another question, this time from Paul. Now, Paul was diagnosed dyspraxic in 2017 at the age of 47. And he now has a BSc in psychology research. Uh, Paul asks, did your school years ever leave you feeling unaccepted in society? Were you an outsider at school? Fucking absolutely, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know the alphabet till I was, you know, 28 years old. <laughs> straight in there straight in second there second or first word i mean it's not a surprise is it if you get sean ryder on anything live you sort of know you're flying by the seat of your pants but nobody was there to think that one through were they no i mean this is it i mean sean sort of looks a bit like i mean i love sean ryder but he is looking a little bit like jabba the hut with headphones on that pick isn't he um, yeah, or Father Christmas, Raymond Briggs, Father Christmas, but oh. without the um, without the without the bonnet. Ah, totally. And is it Neil? Uh, the presenter is Neil Oliver, isn't it? I think. Neil Oliver, yeah. yeah. Who's who's such an intelligent, um, done so many interesting things. Such an intelligent man, and and I do actually love the way he expresses himself. He's got an incredible way with words, but some of the stuff he says is is quite dubious these days. Well, I yeah, I mean, I I, I hear people sort of saying that his column in uh, I think it's, it's the Scotsman on Sunday. I think he has a column, and that's been mm -hmm. quite interesting of late. I haven't, I have to say, I haven't followed it, but uh, other commentators have mentioned that. I have to say, I don't know whether the sound on that clip was was us or them, but anyway. Um, so what we were kind of touching on there was like, oh, you know, the whole like, uh, how how do I feel about sort of GB News in a way? Like, am I doing the PR secretly, doing the PR for them? Uh, I'm not, sadly, but um, what I do, what I do feel is that um, the the kind of uh, people taking the, the pee out of it. I mean, look, it's again we said it's inevitable. There's loads of examples of it. Some of them are, of, you know, are hilarious. It is a new show, um, but the reaction to it. So, for example, the comedian who did, okay, I know it's Lawrence Fox, but I think there was a the Lawrence Fox um, appearance on Dan Wooden's show. Uh, one of the comedians, one of the people that sort of phoned in or zoomed in as a member of the public uh, was basically showing his arse crack. I mean, you could only tell that because of the mirror image behind him. So there was the arse crack thing. Then there was the classic um, bogus names. Um, so it was, and I will say these carefully, it was Mike Hunt. It was, so even if you say them carefully, they're bad. Uh, Mike Oxlong. And uh, what was the other one? Cleo Torres, which in fairness, it's quite hard to find the joke in that one, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but I mean, so I just I felt that was a little bit um, 
I don't, it was just a bit, there's just something a little bit kind of uh, immature about that, actually. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that is immature. That is puerile, but we get puerile, don't we? Uh, in the, and this has been, I mean, there has been a lot to play with. If you've got a little bit of a puerile sense of humour and you want somewhere to go with it, this has been a good target this week. It's given us all something to have a pop at, hasn't it? It's true, it's true. Well, this is why I've slightly fallen into line with Dan Hodges' tweet. Um, yeah, I quite like Dan Hodges. I know people will be spitting their tea out at this point. But um, GB News will succeed, says Dan, and that will be <laughs> because of its opponents, not its supporters. So is is all the kind of, um, you know, brick lobbying, is it all self-defeating? I think all publicity, as you know, Julian, it's your job. Um, I do think there's something to be said for all publicity is good publicity at this point. I mean, they were never going to be a popular launch with a lot of people. So why not go full incompetent and get the whole world tweeting about you? Are you tempted, given what you've seen of it, I, I, albeit in sort of clip form, I know, but, but are you tempted to kind of dive in a bit more now? To watch any, no. Would I be um, willing to be part of a debate where different political views were represented? Uh, yes. Uh, because I, I, yes, I would be, I'm interested, I am actually, you know, I, I think if there's one thing we learned from what's gone on in recent years, it's that we'd all got into our little sort of media bubbles. And I was absolutely guilty of that, of not uh, not diving in enough into what else was going on outside of what I believed and the people I hang out with who confirm my bias on things. So I was as guilty as anyone of that. So for that reason, yes, I would be um, interested in being part of a debate uh, as long as I was able to be part of a debate with my own political views. So, um, but will I sit and watch loads of it? I'll definitely dip into it a bit just because I am very aware of trying to keep my, I mean, you know, I'll watch bits of Fox News because I'm just sort of fascinated by what's going on over there and, and how they've managed to have such an impact on the voting public. So yes, I mean, I'll look at it. Will I sit back with a nice cup of tea and enjoy it? I doubt that. Well, does, I mean, so if they were to call, like, call you on you to sort of even up a, a panel debate on something, would you entertain yeah, I would entertain yeah. that. Okay. I would, as long as I was there to even up the panel debate. You know, as long as I, I would, if the booking was me to be there with my own political views and opinions, and then yes, um, I, I wouldn't um, entertain uh, sort of anything that that maybe yeah, that was out of keeping with my values and beliefs and politics. So yes, but but in terms of there being a, a kind of debate, you know. Yes, I, I think there always needs to be a debate with many sides. To I interviewed Matt Ford for my podcast. Yeah. And um, that's his whole thing is that, you know, that everybody, you know, in the, in the sort of Labour, the Labour Party and Labour voters were so in their bubble um, that we've kind of let any chance, I say we because I'm a Labour voter, that we let any chance of kind of having anyone electable just elude us for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why he's a kind of centrist, the Blairite, because of that. So, yeah, I think if you look at people who are wanting their own party to be electable, whatever that party might be, we have to have forums where different viewpoints are represented. I, I totally buy that. Yeah, I mean, I can't see Matt uh, necessarily going on, on GB News, I have to say. but um, You think not even to throw the, I, you know, Labour book at them? I mean, mate, it's possible. It's possible. And I know that he can be quite fearsome. I mean, one of the last times I saw Matt was in a Zoom room chat with uh, Shami Chakrabarti. That was interesting. That was pretty feisty. Yeah. He's a very, and, and he's incredibly well informed. I mean, you know, he and, and he knows his shit and he knows how to express it. So that's, you know. That's some good stuff he's got there. Yeah. There. Uh, well, I definitely want to get Matt on the show, actually, at some point. I will definitely be asking him. Um, I think that's good. I think it's important that GB News know that you're available. They obviously have your Twitter handle now. They know how to get a hold of you. And really, it's just about how much. No, it's not. It's actually not. As we know, you get paid sod all for those things. Um, so, yeah, but it's a bit like when Jeff Norcott did, um, you know, did question, you know, not, yeah, did question time for the first time, you know, and you do lay yourself open with those things. And, you know, somebody like him, you know, I work a lot with Jeff. I've got a huge respect for him as a comedian. And most forums that he goes into, he's the kind of counter to everything else that's going on. Um, but you wouldn't say, well, he shouldn't be doing that or the BBC shouldn't be booking him. You know, he's an important voice to have, um, I think. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, obviously, again, uh, uh, you know, I am Jeff Norcott's PR, uh, as many people will already know. But, um, uh, you know, I'd agree if objectively that's very clear that he does. He, he balances up a room. Um, and I think, yeah, I think as long as GB News find a way of balancing up their panels, then that that their longevity will sort of benefit from that. But my other sort of thought about the longevity overall, and I've read a few pieces on this, there's been really good pieces from um, all sorts of journalists, including Janine Gibson and, and various others. And 
um, the, it's the, the question for me is that a lot of it is obviously based on the culture war dynamics. Now, will that that could burn out, and if that burns out, the interest in GB News will go with it. I mean, I know that's a bit like crystal ball, and for the moment. There is literally not a day goes by when there is not grist to that mill of the culture war. So it's actually quite hard to see that there is an ending. But then it's a, it's a very particular narrative as well. So, And there'll be a counter to this. I mean, you know, if you look at what's gone on, you know, through the decades in every way, culturally, societally, politically, you know, things come and they go in cycles. So I'd say we're in this cycle to stay for quite some time to come. So I would imagine GB News isn't going anywhere for a while. Yeah. OK, now we should leave on that because there's so much more we could do, but it would uh, overtake the show. You can see all the tweets that we've retweeted uh, to our main timeline. But tonight they're under the likes column for discussion. So there's a few people getting into the issue of the advertising and IKEA sort of vault fast in terms of whether or not they were going to advertise with uh, GB News. There's a couple of tweets on that. Matt Chorley, Mac, uh, Mark Wallace. Um, there's the Jim Pickard tweet there about GB News being called uh, Weather Things TV. So there's plenty there for everyone, whether you are a lover, <laughs> hater, or uh, slightly in between, which is no one at the moment. And then there's, um, I mean, there is a very amusing, I may have to do, I, I, I don't think I can resist this. There is a very amusing exchange. So John Nicholson MP, the SNP MP, has very kindly screenshotted tweets that are subsequently being deleted between Matt Stadlin, a uh, broadcaster, I think Matt's still on um, LBC. Very nice man. I see him very often on Jeremy Vine. I keep mentioning the Jeremy Vine Channel 5 show because I watch it every day. Um, and it's between him and uh, John McAndrew, who is uh, sort of GB News' CEO, uh, Big Cheese. And that started the exchange with, is GB News a spoof station? So that is quite similar to a lot of uh, uh, tweets in that vein. You know, is it North Norfolk TV and all that kind of thing? And then John McAndrew <laughs> replied, no, it's a startup, Matt, with all the difficulties entailed. But I appreciate you're sending your CV and applying for a presenting role on several occasions. To which Matt then replies, it's an embarrassment, John. I'm really glad you, did, you didn't have the courtesy to reply to my CV. Had you done so, you might have offered me a job and I might then have been part of the embarrassment. Um, now, John um, Nicholson seems to think that, that, that that's a win for Matthew Stadlin. But as this tweet underneath the original, uh, uh, I didn't fancy her anyway. <laughs> it's basically the characterisation, I think. I mean, it's a bit... A bit embarrassing. I mean, the happy ending with this is that the two of them have made up on Twitter. They've deleted their, um, their, their, their original spat, which is very admirable. But, you know, we are a show about Twitter. So, you know, I'm sorry that, that I am going to look for the screenshots. Um, and, but it is, I mean, it is good that people can actually make, go back from that um, because it's a, a wee bit queasy. Have you ever had anything queasy like that happen to you on Twitter? Do you know, I'm... I am quite opinionated, um, as you probably know, you know me a little bit, but I do, I do a sort of, um, I do don't, I, I don't really use Twitter to get embroiled in this kind of stuff. I, I just don't. So my Twitter is is kind of more upbeat and um, talking about shows and retweeting people's stuff I like. I'm quite, yeah, I don't really get into anything too controversial on Twitter. Um, part, I just think it can be, I mean, I'm a funny guest in that regard because I, I don't That's really get embroiled in stuff. Yeah, I don't. Outlook. I've gone out. I've gone out with a couple of guys uh, over the years who've who've had personas on Twitter, you know, so accounts that aren't aren't in their name, but you know, where they're not pretending it's in their name, where it's the whatever. I won't say what they are, but you know, like a sort of GB news fails type thing. Only they're behind whatever it might be, and they've got and they get so immersed in it, and I just think, oh, and they sort of think they live this alternate reality that seems to be quite <laughs> toxic. So I, I don't know. I, I I'm I'm quite sort of old school in how I use Twitter. So no, is in answer to your question. No, I mean, in fairness, that is sort of the one of the reasons for setting up the show was yes i'm a twitter holic but it not in a not in the way that you've just described i can i totally i can see where those guys are coming from but not in that way it was it was meant to be a forum for you know i collect tweets throughout the week so this this release of actually being able to talk about twitter with someone else is is fantastic because actually um that's kind of what you want to make it real in a way and there was semi sort of inspired by uh, an item on the news I saw about a group of people who um, would go into pubs and talk about whatever Facebook posts they 
scene or that day. So they'd actually moved Facebook into a discussion group, um, which is kind of what we're sort of we're trying to do here but it's a bit like aa though isn't it it's like you know so you, you go to an aa or an na meeting like if we need meetings to help us process it maybe there's a problem with how much we're consuming it yeah i could say yeah i know i've got a problem that's i know you and that's fine i no, hello i'm julian and i'm addicted what to was the, did you watch the um i should remember what the name is the the, the thing that everybody watched on the social whatever oh, the, the, social, what oh, the, the documentary yeah what was oh. it called oh so the film we'll, we'll is dig it out but uh, yes yeah, so tristram there's a guy called tristram uh, yeah. mainly behind it um but basically looking at the impact of us living in mm. a world that's entirely governed by social media and what impact that's having on us as a society and what we can do and i know so many people who watch that and they're like right that's it i know they didn't delete their twitter or their facebook or anything but people who made adjustments like, i'm only going to look at twitter once a day and i'm going to hide notifications of course within a month everyone's back to what they were doing to start with but i mean it is a you know it is a it's a bit of a of all the social media platforms and i i'm on them all it's probably the one i least enjoy being on if i'm honest i'm so the opposite <laughs> uh yeah but it suits your job right it suits your job if you're, if you're in pr you can't really ignore twitter yeah although you could say the same about instagram and i really am not that keen on instagram See, i like instagram mm. i i just find it a much more a bit like getting into a warm bar this this feels with like all a... your friends <laughs> Yeah, and some people have actually posted pictures to that effect, I think. There you go. Now that the restrictions are lifting, what could be nicer? I mean, that's interesting because that's a bit of a, there's a bit of a yin-yang kind of uh, thing going on with the uh, Insta and Twitter because they are, they do feel like almost like the polar opposite, don't they? They do. And I don't know how many, I mean, I've been on Twitter for five years or something and I don't know how many tweets I've done, but it will be not very many compared to most people who've been on for as long as me. Yeah, well, you've picked some great ones tonight, though, and I'm very glad you picked this one. It is, uh, well, it's, it's basically the headline tweet, really, um, the Dominic Cummings. So if you just want to read that one out and then you can venture So, forth. yes, I'm just going to move on. So Cummings leaks WhatsApp of Boris Johnson, which show he was considering giving Hancock the sack and replacing him with Gove. Now, full disclosure, there were lots of much funnier tweets that showed this same screenshot. But as you know, Julian, I was out with my dad for Father's Day, so I didn't have time to ferret through well, all the you. ones I'd liked. But there were some very, very funny comments about this. I mean, to me, this was the, the language on it. You know, it was, I said, why is he kind of like he's in a sort of, you know, year nine WhatsApp group? Like, the, 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 I think Boris Johnson's language in this and his, I mean, that's what absolutely beggars belief, among other things. It's like, you know, the, oh, Brill, I'm all ears. You know, it's like, my kids don't even sort of write like that. It was, I just was, I mean, it wasn't a great surprise <laughs> that our great leader might communicate in this way. And the fact that Dominic Cummings came across, I mean, his bits of this seemed incredibly erudite and well-researched compared to our Prime Minister's response. So what a shit show. I, um... So, I mean, he should have he should have said it in Latin or Greek. I don't know why he didn't lose that opportunity. Because he's shit at Latin and Greek, like everything is else. That's, that's not why. what I've that's not what I've heard. Is it not what you've heard? No, I well, Jeremy Corbyn was on Ian Dale's show on LBC a few weeks ago. Going, um, we'll come to the Corbyns later, but he was saying how um, that the, Ian Dale basically asked him who was the most uh, interesting leader that you'd served or PM that you'd served under because he'd served opposite. Cameron, um, Theresa May, and Boris Johnson. And Corbyn sort of without sort of, you know, batting an eyelid, said, well, Boris Johnson was certainly the most entertaining. And he was talking about a, a conversation they'd had where Boris suddenly broke into sort of, uh, I can't remember if it was Latin or Greek, I think it was Latin. And, you know, I thought that was his thing. I, I didn't know he was no, bad but it'll at be, it. The, the, it'll be his, you know, you know how people can pretend they can speak French because they can order a baguette <laughs> and a bit of, you know, cheese in France. It'll be like that. He'll have his thing that he does. I mean, I went, I also, I got my Latin O level as it was in those days. Um, so, you know, I won't do it now, but I could read out a few things in Latin and anyone who didn't know any Latin might be like, oh, you know, but it probably was like, you know, the Eton school motto and one thing he'd learned in, you know, in chapel or something. <laughs> I don't, I don't believe just, he's that br brilliant at uh, Latin. Just, just reading off the edges of coins. <laughs> anyway, I digress slightly. One of the things that sort of obviously fascinates me is what, well, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but um, it's the kind of story that years ago, 80s, 90s, probably 2000s, if it had happened, it, it would have been discussed all week, I think. But it felt like, yeah, 
whatever. I mean, it's partly maybe that's because a lot of people are thinking, yeah, we think that Matt Hancock is, you know, a bit of a knob as well. Or so maybe it's that or maybe it's just the, the world we live in, which let's face it. I mean, if, if you follow the politics for all account where this one is from, I mean, literally there is sort of the gleaning and banging headline sort of every second. And it's like news yeah. overload. That's the world we but live in. But this was, I was surprised. I don't think, I, I don't know about you, but I really didn't think Cummings had much to kind of show. I just thought, well, the reason he's taken so long is because he hasn't got, I didn't realise he really was going to manage to pull stuff like this out of the bag. It just, it also, that the fact that Boris Johnson's been giving out his actual phone number to so many people and not realising that there might be some kind of conflict there or, or sort of security risk, it's, it's just the kind of incompetence of it and the fact that, you know, are they all sort of technologically a bit behind the rest of the world? Why would they not, you know, I, I would, at least he needs to burn a phone. Like, what's going on here? It makes no sense. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's just come, conjure sort of uh, up images of coming, sort of stroking a white hat and having his finger poised over the sort of the button to send this sort of evidence, because he certainly took his sweet time. I was thinking when I, I walked, um, I live in Kentish Town and I was looking down Kentish Town High Street on my way back from Pilates yesterday because I'm nothing if not a North wow, London cliche. Living the North London dream. And I, was, um, and I was walking back up the high street and I thought I saw Dominic Cummings and it wasn't Dominic Cummings, he lives, I think he lives West London anyway. But I was thinking when I thought it was him for a minute, I thought, what must his life be like at the moment? Like the, if he wants to just pop out and get a, you know, a sandwich or a coffee. I don't know, it must be so weird to be him or his kid or his wife given the role he's got and what everyone thinks of him. I mean, maybe he doesn't give a shit. I, I couldn't quite imagine what it would be like to be in his shoes well, right now. Well, I don't know if it could be as bad as when he came back from Barnard Castle and the World's Press and others were parked outside of his house. But he's still but... got that, right? He's still got that present. Like, that's so recent. And that was such a kind of brilliant moment in terms of taking the piss out of him in such a horrendous moment when we realised who was governing us. So that's so recent. And now all of this, and I just think, God, what a weird, and all those stills they took from him, um, you know, giving evidence. I just thought, I don't know, maybe people don't care when they're in that position, but I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to take a stroll through your neighbourhood as Dominic Cummings right now. <laughs> Well, that's the, I guess that's the other side of the equation. So I wonder, you know, what people obviously, there are people who don't like Matt Hancock, so they probably just saw that tweet and thought, I saw the, the WhatsApp exchange and thought, oh, you know, well, at least Boris is thinking along the same lines. But the other half of the equation is, of course, that it's come from Dom Cummings. And, you know, he's, he's still not, what he's got to say may be relevant, but it's still not, it's not, not particularly well liked, is it? He's not well liked. And I will say about Matt Hancock, um, I dare say a lot of us have um, felt very similar um, to what Boris Johnson expresses there. But I always think, um, I always feel maternal towards Matt Hancock. And I don't mean I love him and want him to come and live here. But I, I, a bit of me feels like, you know, it's like when I saw my kids in school plays and I just wasn't sure if they'd learnt their lines and they looked like they were about to fall off the stage or trip over their outfit. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't know if you're going to get through the end of this sentence. And I felt really nervous for them. And something about, same as I used to feel when Theresa May started talking, I'd be like, oh, you do not seem in control of this sentence. And I feel everything Matt Hancock says, even if it's something that he does understand and believes, I'm like, oh, you just don't seem plausible. I feel like you're so out of your depth here like you've been yeah like you've been put in the sixth form play when you're only 11 you know he doesn't he doesn't instill confidence in me let's just say but clearly not the he doesn't instill an antipathy that others might do so for instance i mean you know just striking a name out, a name out of thin air gavin williamson for example you know probably have a sort of less people are sort of less well disposed even to Gavin Williamson. Well, I don't feel well disposed towards Hancock and that probably sounds like I'm just a really bad mother. How could I have maternal feelings and think he's an arsehole? But there's something about, even though I, I think he's done some pretty horrific things and said, and certainly been quite willing to lie, there's just a sort of, when I see people who just cannot cope when they're thrown to the lions and they're trying to talk to, you know, whatever interviewer and everyone's watching them and they just are so out of their depth. Even if I think they're despicable people, I just think, oh God, something in me just. Mm. You see, this is why I'm not a good person for Twitter because I ultimately I can't be as cruel as people can be because I suddenly get a bit empathetic as well. I think, oh, but he is a human being. He was somebody's toddler, and he hasn't learnt to speak in public properly yet. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, well, it's a bit of a rogue. It's a slight sort of rogues gallery this evening. So, but right, I'm tempted to sort of jump on to. Uh, uh, to Piers Corbyn, but I'm not going to. I'm going to break it up with a little bit of Richard Madeley because you know we all, we should all break things up with a little bit of Richard Madeley. Uh, 
So um, he does crop up in unexpected places, doesn't he, Richard Madeley? That's what he's made a career out of, and here he is again. Here he is again. So yeah, you picked out David Bedil's tweet on this. If you just want to read that out, and then we'll get to it. So this is David Bedil saying, one day I would quite like to see Steve Coogan do a bit called Alan Partridge reads out Richard Madeley's best lines, and this was in response to Madeley having gone more Partridge than Partridge. Um, on Good Morning Britain. Yeah, so this is a chap called Scott who, uh, I assume it's a chap called Scott, who, who tweeted that uh, Madeley's just gone full partridge again when talking about Shamima Begum. So let's listen to the clip. Making a mistake is getting on Twitter. He says, look, at the age she left, <clears throat> making a mistake is getting a tattoo that you regret or a one night stand, but deliberately joining a terrorist organization that loathes and hates the country you come from and all the effort involved in getting there seems to tell a clear story to me. We've had lots and lots of messages like that. There's one interesting point. I was thinking about this last night. Obviously, we had the Nuremberg trials after the war, and we hanged quite a few Nazis and imprisoned a lot of others, and we let them out eventually. But we didn't go after the Hitler Youth. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, we didn't go after the Hitler Youth. We only went after adults um, who served in the Hitler regime. And that's just something to reflect on, I think. Anyway, thank you. Oh, Twitter, my word. <laughs> And it's Suzanne Reed's oh. face. I mean, the whole thing is, it, it could not be more Partridge, could it? If it tried. I mean, I think if they'd done this uh, on an actual Partridge oh. episode, they'd have been, someone would have gone, no, Steve, that is a, that's a bit over the top, you know, that no one's going to buy that. It's too Partridge for Partridge, isn't it? Oh, goodness me. I mean, he's, there's, been a, <laughs> there's been a few Maidley moments uh, recently. Was one well, not that long ago when he was talking about uh, you know when your family pet has become too much of a burden you know is it time was it is it time to kill the dog or whatever it was just something just so sort of you know uh emphatic but i mean he's such a cringe with i mean he used to i i think i'm a bit older than you julian but i certainly watched him when he presented this morning with um judy finnegan um that was what i got through my sort of uni days watching when I was meant to be revising so in the late 80s I saw you know every day I'd watch them on this morning and he was just always saying completely inappropriate things and he's and I, I've met him quite a few times through my job in telly you know he's he's sort of been in that same world and he just has a he you feel like he's always on the cusp of a massive gaffe that he's never more than three sentences away from some shit like this you know he he's that's just what he does Oh dear, I I think I'm older than you think, actually, Kelly. But yes, I, I mean I do remember, um, I do remember those sort of days, really. But uh, he's quite he's quite a collector's item, I have to say. Um, but he does look exactly the same he, as he did he looks, when I was at university. And he looks exactly the same. I mean, there's a portrait in his latic, isn't there? There's got to be. There's got to be, but that literally looks like he looked when he was in the Liverpool dock in 1987. Oh, yeah, I remember that, with the weatherman standing on the map of the on UK. A ma on a phone <laughs> map. Yes, young people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before we have to explain the show in subtitles to our younger viewers, let's, exactly. uh, let's go to another lost cause. Uh, yes, it's Piers Corbyn. Um, and this is, uh, this is a tweet by uh, literary agent Johnny Geller. Fire away, Callie. Piers Corbyn proving once again the old adage, revolution begins by the careful removal of public health stickers. So, yeah, this was um, this was uh, Piers Corbyn doing what he likes to do best, erratic behaviour based on his um, conspiracy fueled mentality. So this was him taking down all the stickers, the Covid compliance stickers on uh, on the tube. Wow. That's such a such a revolutionary but doing doing it so yeah i mean carefully is the worst because he's doing it's like oh no I better not leave a trace you know yeah, it's more thorough i don't think it's i don't think it's respectfully carefully the bit i feel well i mean there's a few things you think when you see this but also um he's wandering about without a mask when everyone else is trying to be considerate and have a so that the fact he's quite willing to do that i know no surprise but it's quite a crowded tube but also like no one's got money and resource and time to bugger about on you know on the tube at the moment i know um one of my friends is a tube driver this is not an easy time for people working down there they don't need this shit going on okay. look at his hair Come on, look at that he looks like um what's his name marty mcfly uh you mean uh, doc yeah yeah yeah, yes. yeah 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 well i mean obviously he's got the sort of the hair dryer effect coming through the middle of the tube there i mean you know i don't yeah i i just uh i mean he's no stranger to being arrested he's already been arrested recently and I think that London Transport certainly asking some questions after they saw this footage. 
Um, I mean, he's he's a he's a weather forecaster by trade, but I mean, I think he's on the sort of uh, climate denial side. I think they should put him on a foam map, which again, our younger viewers won't know what, why I'm saying that. <laughs> put him on a foam map and set him out to sea. Yeah, well, it's 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 maybe you know who knows. I don't know what his next move is. I mean, I dread to think what his next move is going to be after uh, the sort of the lockdown. Um, you know, the kind of. I mean, we we've had a lockdown. We've had an anti-lockdown movement, which has been fairly vocal. I mean, I know in the states with reopen, you know, it had a massive part to play and all the rest of it. But it's it is an, it's a yet another sort of schism in our politics, and that's something you can see absolutely on Twitter. You know, we've had Brexit and then we've had the lockdown and, it, you know, there, we're in so many Venn diagrams now. I think we may have lost ourselves. I don't know. Yeah, we may have done. But this is, and, and you know, people, are, I am a believer in the right of free speech. But, um, yeah, what a prick. <laughs> well, there you're exercising your free speech there, Kelly. So that's, that's absolutely fine. So I think we have managed, look at the, we're sailing on time. Uh, we have managed to get to, uh, right, you're going to have to do the pronunciations and everything. It's, it's Cap, Capybara Man. Capybara, yeah, Capybara. And this is a baby bara. So there's the only, the, the reason I put this, out, partly because that's cute. I mean, look at that cute thing. That but cute. Um, everyone likes a picture of a baby animal. But this account, it's really for this account. So Capybara Man, um, it's definitely worth a look at. So this is a guy who, um, I'm assuming a guy, as it says Capybara Man, who tweets, um, only tweets about capybaras. And because I am the parent of an autistic zookeeper who happens to be, uh, well, he's a primate specialist, but he's a, generally a mammal keeper. So that's what he does. So he's, he's all about the mammal. So I know an enormous amount about weird mammals that lots of people haven't heard of. So this is this is basically a large um, rodent, as you can probably see. Um, it's a south. It's a native to South America and it's not endangered, actually. So it's actually. But the interesting thing about the capybara and I'm working up some material about this for my comedy um, is that it's a so it's a therapy. It's used as a therapy animal. So, you know, you have like therapy dogs and therapy that go into hospitals and stuff. The capybara has a, and if anyone is watching who does know a lot about the capybara, they'll correct me on the details. But basically, they they are like the chilled out kind of stoner at the party. They'll calm everyone down. They're wise. They soothe everybody. And what if you put them in with any other animals, they calm down the animals and sort of sort out the neuroses of other species. So they're this sort of kind of wise stoned guru of the animal world as well. So they're just such an interesting animal. And this guy does nothing but tweet about capybaras. He also does try and flog merchandise for capybaras, but I, it's a very, it's a nice antidote to some of the stuff you see on Twitter. There is a lot of nice animal sort of stuff on Twitter, I must admit, um, or there's some cu curious stuff. But I mean, that really, this really is niche, isn't it? I mean, you just... It's really niche. No one would have found this um, without, I mean, I don't know how many, I can't remember how many followers he's got, um, but, but you know, he's not like in the hundreds of thousands. But yeah, he is. Um, and actually, I only found out about him because I was backstage at a gig. Hey, not bad. And I, so it's not bad. Not bad. Yeah, I was talking. I was talking with someone at a gig about my son's zookeeper job, and I said, "Oh, I need to start working up some um, kind of mammal keeper material." Um, and then she said, "Oh, you've got to look at this capybara man. There's some really good shit in there." So, but I mean, you know, everyone's looking at cats falling off wardrobes. No, who's looking at a baby bara and tell us now? Well, totally. I and mean, then and Greta Thunberg is following him. I mean, what, you know, there you go. And me, and look, Greta Thunberg and Callie <laughs> Beaton. That might be the only time you see us next to each other um, in the world of social media. So that alone is worth something. Yeah, that's true. That that that's an interesting billing, actually. That's the other thing. Uh, it also looks like my podcast is called Namaste Moth, which is not what it's. No, called. it's not. Well, we can we can absolutely. Well, you have a little uh, plug zone uh, in order to to talk about. Uh, and we'll do it now. Let's let's talk about. I made you do it. Yeah, it was going to happen. One. Yeah, it was going to happen at some point in the next two minutes. So yeah, t tell me about the podcast because that is one of that's your latest sort of. Uh, my latest venture. latest venture. Yes, so Namaste Motherfuckers. So I thought I would try and do, um, or try and do. I am doing. I thought I would do a podcast where the three sort of things I sort of do the most are obviously comedy. Um, kind of stuff to do with work and business. So with my background, sort of, you know, broad level in telly and stuff. So I get booked to talk a lot about those things. And then I also worked as a coach and done loads of stuff in the, in the sort of self-help 
emotional intelligence arena sort of well-being so I thought if there's a way to bring all of that together and get people's kind of life stories but through those kind of prisms that's what I'll do so namaste motherfuckers also seem to sum up my kind of feelings about the world so I am quite kind of you know I'll meditate and I'll do stuff that's good for my chakras but I'm also quite um I've got quite a sort of dark sense of humor and and I and I'm not very earnest so it seemed to sum it up really so yeah it's it's sort of um it is based on interviews I've interviewed Jeff Norcott among others and it's but it's looking at um it leads up to what their namaste motherfucking moment is so what damaste moment um has changed their life but generally i tend to get stories people don't always get out of my guests um mm. so i've had some really lovely ones um rosie jones i had a popular episode with her richard osman tomorrow john lloyd is coming out john lloyd wow. as in creator of black adder and hitchhiker's guide and oh. qi um so yeah i've got it and it's not so it's not all com comedians on it um there are comedians on it but writers artists you know i've got the founder of the hoffman process um coming on in a couple of weeks so so it's pretty eclectic but it's i love it i love doing it it's my favorite thing i do at the moment yeah well i, I can totally understand that i mean it, it, you know it, doing this is is really really great fun and that is and that is something i'm i'm certainly interested in the well-being side of things as well and uh I, I don't consider myself particularly new age, but I do think that things like meditation, are, you know, they are very important tools. And um, yeah, it's interesting that you're getting good stuff out of your subjects. Uh, um, I mean, I've... yeah, sort of weird, weird stories. I think it probably is because I've done so much work in the sort of therapy and coaching arena people sort of kind of calm down and, and sort of do say things. It's a bit like they're with wellbeing when you say I'm not new age. It's a bit like that, Arthur, I've had Arthur Smith on and Arthur, he doesn't tell this joke in my podcast, but I've heard him do a joke on stage where he talks about Radio 4 and if he's in a young club, you know, not, he goes, you know, and I'm sure lots of you, you know, lots of you probably aren't Radio 4 listeners. I mean, if you have never listened to Radio 4, don't worry, you will. Um, and it's that <laughs> yes. idea that every, and it's a bit that. like that with well-being and new age stuff. I mean, you know, it's easy to be cynical when you're 22 and go, ah, oh, you know, sod it. But as you get older, you're like, if I don't start to believe in my spirit, my body's going, what am I going to have left? So I think people come to well-being sooner or later. Yeah. I mean, obviously, what you've got left is, is Twitter. That's what we'd say here, here at Let's Kill Twitter Towers. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I need, I need my spirit as well as <laughs> my time. That's why you line. need your spirituality to counter this stuff. Oh, you're too right. You're too right. So we are, we, I can't believe that we've come in to land uh, literally to time. I didn't think that was going to happen tonight. I didn't get time to tell what I'm going to tell it anyway. But one of the fun things about GB News is that if you look at their schedule, um, you've got Jubes and Co, Halligan and Di Piero and all the rest of it. Quite a lot of GB News' schedule is like you booked a lot of folk acts end to end. <laughs> Or comedy double acts, which I found quite interesting. Nobody else seems to have picked up on that. I haven't yet found a tweet on that. Maybe I'll go to GB News Fails to find that out. But I should also be following GB News Wins because obviously I've been extremely balanced about that tonight and quite right too. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been great fun for me. I'm just going to sort of wrap up for the streamers. Um, scrolling above our heads all the way through the show has been Callie's uh, handle at Callie Beaton. Um, and also the details of where you can follow us, obviously at LKT Zoom. You can catch tonight's show on YouTube, uh, so download the stream. I'll be making some little edits to that a bit later, only in the text, in the text sense, that is. Um, no, no censorship. But please do uh, follow us on Twitter at LKT Zoom, that would be fantastic. Uh, if you'd like to support our work, you know, the cost of the green screen, and the new computer I had to buy for OBS, you can go to um, the uh, website, uh, Buy Me A Coffee. I was just about to name one of the other ones. You can go to buymeacoffee.com and find the Let's Kill Twitter page and buy, and buy us a coffee. Obviously, that's what it's there for. Uh, next week's show will be at uh, 8 p.m. and I'm going to have Richard Sandling with me. It should be fantastic. Um, and that is, that's basically that, really. Um, Callie, where can people see you next? I am on at the boat. It might not be my next one, but I'm gigging a lot now. It's all on my website. It's fairly up to date. My live gigs page on CallieBeaton.com. Um, but the next one I can remember is Friday night, the boat show, which is on the Tattersall oh, Castle the at Embankment, which is one of my absolute favourite clubs in all Brilliant. the world. I'm emceeing their gala comeback show. So that's the next one I know I've got. And that's next Friday, 25th. That's fantastic. That is a great show, a super venue. It's always a brilliant lineup. Um, if you're in London, in around London, obviously do check that out. Please do check out Callie's podcast as well, Namaste Motherfuckers. 
That's a, now we never get tired of saying give that title, will you? It's um, a nice title. People I can book guests on the back of the title and they're like, sure, that sounds like fun. So thanks very much for watching, guys. We really hope you've enjoyed the show. Please look out for the clips on our uh, various accounts on Twitter, but we'll also post them on Facebook and Instagram because I have to be on Instagram. And also we will be on podcasts as well. So this show will go out as a podcast fairly soon this week. Um, so you can't, you don't really have an excuse, really. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.